Stephen Bassett's back in the building. Welcome to the Evoke Bike Podcast, everybody. I'm Brendan Hauser. So Stephen Bassett was at the Evolo training camp. He's actually working with Evolo now. So I want to chop it up with him, just some basics about what they were trying to get out of him as a pro at the training camp for these younger athletes. And then we talk about coaching athletes, Stephen's plans for the upcoming year with Denver Disruptors. They're going to be doing a whole bunch of races besides the NCL crit scene. We talk about what Stephen calls simulation versus stimulation in training. Obviously, some carb talk. Some of the things he's working on now a little bit more zone three with feathering in VO2. And if you listen to the previous podcast with Steven, he's not doing as much of the 4020s as he used to. If you want to get nitty gritty, you can check out the topics below in the chapters. We obviously don't make a chapter for every topic, so it's better to just listen to the whole thing. Steven always has a ton of gems to drop. We really appreciate you, man. Thanks for cruising through the podcast again. And everybody, good luck with your training and racing. We'll talk to you soon. See ya. I la I thought when I saw you with the Volo, I thought that was like a funny joke. And I was like, oh no, you actually were there. And then yeah, I just realized yeah. you're on the website. What are you doing with these guys? Uh yeah, it just kind of happened. Like uh I gave Creed a call last uh last August or so. Um, so I kind of saw the writing on the wall that wasn't gonna stay in Europe. So I knew he was on the ground in the US. So I wanted to pick his brain about the situation over here and which teams were doing what. So mm. um, as we were talking, he was like, man, you should come kind of be a, a bit of a mentor to the younger guys. I think they've done it with Rob Britton in the past. Mm. And it's like, you know, just somebody who's, you know, halfway between his age and the guys to kind of help relay some of the messages they're trying to get across. That's what are some of those messages? Um, Just kind of the basics of being a professional. I think it's just, you know, crossing your eyes, and uh dotting your t's <laughs> um but the low-hanging fruit a lot is that on the bike off the bike a mix of everything yeah i think uh, i think a mix of everything you know um these are all super young guys so it's a u23 team all under 23 so you know for a lot of them it's new some of them are lifers like me you know they've been doing it since they were 12 uh, but some of them you know one guy i think had been riding for like 18 months so it's like this oh, is all wow. kind of novel. So yeah, just some of the basics. I looked through the roster. I've heard some of the names of obviously I've raced against Brooks a couple times somewhere down in like the Georgia area. And I was like, wow, that's hilarious. This kid's 20. So he was like 12 when we raced. <laughs> like, yeah. Just oh, I'm envious of people that have that found the sport so early. That's really cool. So and act so I don't would I'm really curious, and maybe you don't want to talk about this on camera, mm -hmm. but um the writing on the wall when you were in Europe, finishing up things with rally, like how does that all, what was your mindset going through that? Do you want to, are you cool talking about that? I yeah. Think yeah. People, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Like do you start looking around in Europe or are you like, I'm coming home. I'm kind of over this or what's your 28 now. Is that right? Uh, yeah. About to be 29. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's, uh, I think. And one more thing say, before you go in, yeah. sorry, people always yeah, say yeah. I cut people off. No. I know how strong you are and I know people that have raced you know you're freaking insane. So I always think, I know maybe a lot of people to hear this aren't going to understand the context, but it's like, dude, if you can't make it, holy crap. Or like if, is this yeah. age? Is this like just the connection? Like, yeah. So like, I mean, it's just not to blow smoke at you, but I mean, look back at what you did before you went over there look what you were doing at first internet and everyone's like, okay, dude, Steven, go away. Like we get it. So I think it's just, you know, it's hard for people to fathom like, dude, Steven's coming back. Um, yeah. So sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but just to add context for people that might not know, go look at how strong Steven is, um, before you say anything. So. Yeah. I think, um, some of it's just situational, like, the line between pro Connie and world tour is very small right now. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, you have like your tutor, your Q365, your lotto, your um, Israel that are all basically world tour teams, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not quite the same budget, but all the same resources. And so it's like, you have those teams that can scoop up hitters. And then you have the smaller pro Connie teams. You have your Kaha, those type of teams but they're kind of regional. So if you're not from the Basque country, mm -hmm. trying to get on Uskadi is not really going to work out. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of, I'm kind of at the level where I was like, 
yeah, if I was as good as I am and from, you know, Valencia, right. this might work out. But as a foreigner, you there's the barrier to entry seemed to be kind of one step away mm. um, from where I am to stay mm. there. Okay. So what's how are you feeling about the vibe coming home? Going to be doing the NCL stuff. Uh, you're going to mix it up in like local road races. What's what's what are you thinking for 2024? Yeah, I think um, all the NCL stuff, and then we pretty much do all the, you know, all the 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 couple of major road races that we have in the U.S. Okay, um, probably going to try and mix in a little bit more gravel. I enjoy mm. that. Mm -hmm. um and just kind of feel out if that's something i want to pursue in the future mm -hmm. I'm, i mean i'm not totally sure i think it fits my my physiology pretty well um but we'll see and see if uh that is interesting or not right have you done much i think you were gonna start gravel racing did you not have you done much uh, i've done a few just for fun i've never really taken it seriously okay so yeah just the just the normal schedule pretty much of the u.s races so what kind of gravel catches your eye? Which which events would you really like to get into? Um, I'm doing this Southern Cross one, um, a local one coming up, and then maybe like try this Belgian waffle ride in Asheville to get a taste of some of the bigger ones and see what's going on there a little bit. Mm. And that's kind of gnarly from what I've gathered, like for on the skill. Are you good off road? I'm decent. I mean, yeah, I've had a couple, I broke my collarbone at a gravel race last year, but uh, <laughs> in general, yeah, I think I'm, you know, the Southie, is it Southeast competent. gravel? Is that the one you're going to? Uh, no, I think it's like, it's kind of a standalone okay. thing, like part of some other mountain bike gravel series that I don't really know about. But we yeah. could strike fear in a lot of people when they were like, Oh damn it. Steven's coming. Okay. Maybe I'm not going to win what's and then so and then you're coaching correct mm -hmm. so kind yeah. of bouncing all over the place so do you see yourself going into coaching do you see yourself st trying to stay in cycling if you end up maybe you go the gravel route maybe you don't what's or are you just kind of playing it year by year right now yeah i'm i think i'm definitely gonna be in coaching um for sure pretty pretty committed always as a as a part of my life you know it's like i've spent so much time Mm -hmm. figuring all this stuff out for myself mm -hmm. so i think there's a lot of kind of information i have that we can kind of just skip a few steps for people yeah and then have the you know kind of the experience to know when to just take common sense and be like yeah of course you should rest you're a little bit sick you know mm -hmm. um and how to convey those messages in a way that makes sense because i've had to learn them all myself you know mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, I mean, that's an awesome skill set to have of making it over there, racing in Europe, but then also you've kind of, for people I just posted on Instagram, like the first podcast we did, you're into the training aspect that even if someone's not trying to be a pro, but they're just doing amateur stuff and maybe they have a nine to five job, like you, you're into that. You're not just like this freak athlete who hasn't been paying attention to what he's doing. I, you know, I, that's why I really like yeah, the first yeah. podcast. I think you had just said a lot of stuff that resonated for a lot of amateur riders also, which is kind of, kind of why I wanted to catch up about this training camp because uh, I was just curious what you're doing with the Volo. But also I think when people say, and this is maybe, I don't know. Nah, I mean, I guess fours and fives do training camp sometimes too, but the number one thing is like, oh, we're going to go ride 40 hours over the next three days. Like, this is going to be the best training camp ever. And I, I'm a big, oh, I love big volume. I try to like tamp it down to a realistic amount for people before they go. But maybe can you shine some light on more detail of like things that maybe Creed said, hey, this is what I want to get across to these guys. And they're, you know, they're doing, they're, so they're a club team now, right? They're not, yeah, not yeah, anymore. Club team. But they're doing all like the big races that they can get into. Um, so maybe what are those guys thinking of? But then maybe also we chat about like how does this relate to the people coming up and um and then maybe just get into some general training stuff because I realize a lot of camps are gonna be over by the time we post this. But yeah, I'll definitely earmark this and repost for next year as people go going through like winter camps. So let's kind of start with the I'm curious, Creed has a huge history 
um what when you were like all right i'm coming to this camp what was his like big goal for you besides besides just like the general mentorship or maybe he he was just like yo just go chop it up with these guys yeah it was uh it was pretty open-ended i think i showed <laughs> up at the airport and they're like oh what are you doing what what are you doing here and i was like oh I'm, I'm here to train with you guys uh i that thought i awesome. would tell you <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah no it's he uh Especially, I think this one may have been a little bit different for them because they were going into Valley of the Sun right after. So I think there was more of an emphasis on, you know, keeping a roof on things mm. um, and keeping uh, keeping things a bit more under control. Okay. But then there was definitely still a bit of, I mean, I think that's a, a great part of a training camp is to do a bit of racing. Because one of my big things is like, like I'm always telling people like stimulation versus simulation. So like, and the more you race the less like simulation you need uh, so what i mean by simulation is like okay you're gonna do like these efforts that are just like the last 5k of a race you know you're gonna pretend you're gonna be racing five people or it's stimulation which is stimulating the growth and stimulating the training so stimulation might be just doing you know four by 20 zone three it's not like anything super race specific it's not doing 30 30s into the zone three it's this is the thing I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to improve my threshold. So I do this zone three. Mm. So I think there's a need for both. And I think different people in their careers have different needs for both. So like me, it's like, I've been racing, like I've been racing a long time. So I don't need to do 15 race simulations to prepare. You know, I'm better served generally raising my level. And then doing a little bit of simulation to just kind of get those sensations, get that last little bit. But so that's, that's something I'm always toying with when, when I'm doing my intervals and stuff. It's like, okay, you could simulate a race, you know, you could go out and ride in the rain to get ready for racing in the rain. But does that make you better? Like, does that make you sick? Or does that make you tired or whatever, where it's like, okay, you could ride the trainer and do all your intervals and be stronger for it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit of a balancing act. And it's like, yeah, if you've never ridden in the rain, you might need to ride in the rain, but you know, it, so, it changes. So this is actually an interesting, uh, I guess, branch off that I'm immediately thinking of for the athletes that do six races over a year. Maybe they're like, Hey, my mm -hmm. first big race is in April. And they're like, so, and I have received emails where like, do you think I can do a training race in March or will that like throw off my training? And I'm like, dude, no, no way. Hold on. Did I have you're, I don't think you've been listening. Like we want races before a race that you think you're going to do well at. So this is your simulation for those athletes. Do I, is that correct? Like, would you definitely be pro get in the super fast group ride, do a race and like something before your block of racing starts? Are you? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, again, it depends on where you are in your career, you know? Yeah, if, yeah. You're, if you're starting out, if you're, Good you know, point. in your first couple of years of racing, I think it's 100% go to every race you can. Okay. And then as you kind of like start finding your level and start focusing in a bit more on certain things and you start weighing out all these things of mm -hmm. what do I get and what does it cost? Right. Um, the, the calculus changes slightly. Let's talk about that. What are some of the what does this cost and what do I get? Because it's very interesting that you bring this up because I, and I don't want to talk. So like I went to Swam Classic and I, this is actually, I was glad I went because I realized that my back was not ready to race. And so then I'm like, well, geez, I was planning to go to these other races, the cost to go literally the financial cost, but also the time cost. I'm like, why would I go if I'm not going to race hundred percent, I should actually be spending my energy on rehabbing. Um, so that's like one example for people. What are some of the things that you think of as athletes grow in their, what we'll call cycling career, like the costs and gains from going to the races? Yeah. So I kind of think like, if you're not 95% there's, and you don't have to go to the race, there's not a lot of point. Mm -hmm. That's, that's me personally. I hate going to races when I'm not in shape, which mm -hmm. is something like as a professional, you did all the time, you know, you might be sick, you might be, but you got to have five guys to start the race. Mm -hmm. So that happens all the time where you're like, well, I'm sick, but the next guy's throwing up. So I start the race. Mm. It's pretty common. So when you have the luxury of choosing your schedule without those kind of external um, things, you have to requirements, 
you can kind of pick a little more and focus a little bit more. I didn't realize that you had to have five guys. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm, that's it. And it's just start. You can do you have you ever started and just hopped in the car? Uh I don't think yeah. I mean, that's very common. Uh that's very common. Uh I think I've done a lot of I've started half of a lot of bike races. <laughs> um, if that makes sense. And then uh, you know, you just go to the first feed zone and stop when you know yeah. you're sick or but I'm, I'm, there's definitely been guys that have done 300 meters of a bike race. Uh, that's definitely pretty common. So the, tr so what about, I like, and I don't know, I'm trying to think real quickly on the fly, if I've ever really done a training camp and gone into racing. So we started on the simulation stimulation pathway. Is that something that you have picked up recently? Or was this something that you've done in your race career as a pro of do your training camps usually go into the first spring races? Or do you guys do like a base only type camp? And maybe is there like another quote unquote camp before the racing starts or like, and I guess this is a really dumb question. I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, you're in Europe. Aren't you guys mostly riding together anyway? So what would really be like, oh, this is camp week as opposed to like, yo, we're just riding a lot because this is what we do for our job. Yeah, so probably like most pro Connie teams would have one big training camp, maybe two. Okay. And then pro tour teams and bigger pro Connie teams would, they've usually done two or three camps before they do their first race day. Okay. Um, and so it might be like one of those is volume based and then one of them is more intensity. And they also break up into smaller groups generally. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you have your classics group and then within that you'll have four guys riding together, six guys riding together. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have a climber thing that are all kind of doing separate things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a little bit different where like Avola, like I was pretty impressed. It's like they all did everything, you know, it's, wow. it's uh, you know, the full team where even on rally or something, you wouldn't really see that. Hmm. So what's the, like, don't you, how do you feel about that? Because I would think that they're, or maybe people are just even more hyper-specific than I give them credit for that, you know, the classics types rider, or even just in the U S maybe the all arounder could glean something from the climbers and vice versa. Like there's some knowledge share going on because you're not always just climbing. You're not always just like smashing in one minute effort, or is it more, bonding with similar type riders or how does that work yeah i think it's uh, it's like i just try to think of the training camps as like not being that specific you know mm -hmm. you might make your own training really specific and then you have to kind of go into the training camp and be like well this is what we're doing right and uh i, I don't know how creed creed was like yeah if you think you can go ride three thousand meters without getting fitter i don't know who you are you know what i mean like it's like if you go ride hard in the hills you're riding hard in the hills and it's generally good enough you know you're not so he, going there to polish so he's saying wait so the way he said that so it's like as long as you're riding a lot you're getting faster well it was like yeah i don't know anyone that can go ride three thousand meters uphill hard without right. without training you know yeah. if you're losing fitness doing that you have <laughs> i mean man you should be at the yeah you would you know it's like, I'll, yeah, you should be at the like tour that. if you can do that. Yeah, you should. Yeah, you're you're too good for this if you can get slow doing this, you know. <laughs> That's funny. How did, what were some of the things um, that you felt like you passed on well to them or things maybe that they were like, whoa, I've never thought about this, that they were pretty receptive to? Uh, yeah, so I, I wrote down some stuff. Uh, like the, I think I just try to get across like the low hanging fruit which is Let's like the easy, that. the yeah. easy stuff. So it's like, I noticed a bunch of guys, like the first two days or something like, Oh, my knee hurts. I'm like, your knee. Hurts. Like, I, I don't think my knee has hurt since I was 19, you know, because I started doing the like five minute glute activations. And then um, a lot of it, I'm like, yeah, you should just like mechanically fix this pro. Like you need like the one and a half degree wedge. And then you need the insole and like these two $20 products will fix like 90% of knee problems. Mm -hmm. I've, I've given so many people this advice. It's like you go, you buy the wedge and then you buy a specialized insole. And like, this is 98% of any setup that anybody will ever sell you. But why not go back to what you had said before though? Like that sounds to me more like the band aid, whereas they should do the glute activation, the glute work, 
Like this yeah. is, and yeah, this yeah, is yeah. where I screwed up in that I kind of stopped doing all the little things and it's been a perfect storm. Not, I don't use my glutes at all. Like, and I went ah. to a PT here to get dry yeah. needling done. Yeah. And he was like, oh man, you are not working your adductors and abductors. And, you know, I've, I am guilty in that I like lifting. I like lifting heavy. So I sometimes skip over the easier stuff which is foolish it's like you know the one-legged things and um so in all of that I, i'm kind of circling back and working with uh the pt socal bike pt aka mm -hmm. glute yeah, dopers yeah, he's good he's good yeah and so scout and i have been going through some things we're gonna make some videos but so i don't know wouldn't you say they should be doing that as opposed to wedging or is that i'd say they should be doing both Really? So you why know? wedge? I don't know what what's the deal? uh it's I mean I uh, I'm not a physiologist or anything, but, but do you use these? Do you use a wedge? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Really? Absolutely. Cause it's it's something it's like 98% of people. I mean, I'm a little bull legged, so it's like 98% of people need the little bit of wedge. Huh. And then it's just like it's almost like you're you're giving yourself a margin for error where if you have a good insole. And so you don't have to work your muscles as hard to hold your leg up straight. You know, then there's a little room for other, you know, something else to go on and still be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like my knee tracks 100% perfectly, but it gets it within that range of, okay, it's within a few percent of ideal mm -hmm. to where, you know, a little, you know, your saddle can slip one mil in travel or whatever, or you can jump on the other team bike and it fits a little different. So you mm -hmm. kind of build yourself in that buffer um, mm -hmm. with the combo of the exercises and just, I mean, it's like, why wouldn't you support your body correctly? You know, why That's wouldn't you keep the arch from collapse? Like why you don't want to work your arch. You know what I mean? Right. I feel the same thing about like cleat positioning. It's like, if you put your cleat, a lot of people have their cleats, you know, forward or right at the ball of their foot. And it's like, well, if you just put the, mm -hmm. the cleat further back, you kind of take your glute out. Or you take, sorry, you take your calf out and you work your glute more. It's like, mm -hmm. you're not going to win a bike race doing calf raises. Like the mm -hmm. calf is just not a good muscle for bike racing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, you could say like, oh, I just set this up and now my calves are so good at biking. But <laughs> if you're, it doesn't, nobody's having a contest to see if your calves are good at biking, you know, if you're fast. So I think it's these things that are just like, yeah, it's just kind of basic but also kind of like yeah this is kind of better we should if it's better we should kind of do it all the time it's like it's the same with eating you know it's like if you if i eat a lot of sugar i'm better so why would i ever want to go on like i i don't think i've ever gone on a like i just don't do low carb ever i don't believe in it. it's like w would you tell your car to get better at running on empty no it's like i'm gonna run my <laughs> car on empty all the time and then maybe maybe it'll learn that it doesn't need the the gas it's like it's you can tell yourself if you want that but i i just i think it's like yeah if this is the easiest best way to do something that's what we do all the time mm. i like that yeah i kind of went off there no i like dude we have t you are i i think a few podcasts afterwards i even said to people before we like got on the camera i was like all right and stephen bassett went on these things we call tangents so like please go on those <laughs> go down like the roads what are some of the other low-hanging fruit that you saw with these guys um yes yeah, some you know sometimes it's like oh i didn't feel like eat you know i'm a little no feel mm. good today you know didn't eat enough it's like the keeping the sugars up is the cardinal rule that's mm. the number one rule all the time so it's like, yeah, sometimes you're like, ah, oh, oh, I don't really feel like eating a bagel. It's early. I don't, it, it, like, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. You just got to eat it. Um, that uh, one granular thing I noticed was sometimes it was like the guys would make the protein pancakes. And it's like, yeah, I don't, I'm always telling people like I, people love protein pancakes. And I used to do them too. But then it's like if you use the the regular pancake that's like pretty much 100% carb and then you add the Greek yogurt to it, it's like the carb comes first and then you add protein. Um, so I think sometimes if you do those pancakes, it's at the expense, you're getting protein, which is good, but it's at the expense of carbs. So mm -hmm. it's like you need to calculate that into your into your intake to make sure that you, uh, that you get, up. it's like, yeah, it's like 
I don't know. I keep coming back to this thing with like, this is something else I was telling those guys. It's like, if you're going to a race and you're worried about stuff, it's like, are you fed? Are you watered? And are you rested? Like, are you like, basically it's like, this is a, you're now like a show pony. You are now like an, it's like, you have to, if you have these three things, you can perform in bike racing, you know, like you can, you know, if you slept three hours, it's not ideal, but you can do it, you know, but mm-hmm. as long as you like cover the, it's like the basics, the basics, the base, you know, the fundamentals, the basketball. <laughs> I'm just laughing at show pony. What's, how do you feel if you have a bad night's sleep, say you're on the road or you're staying at a host house or whatever, you have a bad night's sleep. I'm just curious on this. How does going hard feel to you or what is the lack of sleep? Like, how do you manage that on race day? You're like, okay, yeah, I didn't, I slept like crap. I got five hours of sleep. What's your, do you have like a thing, like anything in your head to like try to alleviate that mentally or even physically? Yeah, I mean, typically, I feel like you'd be surprised at the amount of caffeine that's going around European races, Mm. uh, where it would likely be like, you know, two coffees in the morning, a Red Bull at the start, another dose of caffeine. I'm big on doing the caffeine um, earlier in the in the day, like two to three hours before the finish. This is something Gavin Mannion taught me. It's like the takes kind of 40 minutes to peak and then it's good for like two hours okay um so like slamming the caffeine gel 15k to go is kind of too late it's just right. gonna inhibit your sleep that night so um, just so i heard that correctly two to three hours before the finish so you're taking it two to three hours before the finish or you're taking it even before that so it peaks no no two, yeah kind of eight. taking it taking okay it, you know two two and a half hours before the finish so really then say you have a four-hour race um, because that's kind of like longest U S road race and I'm yeah. U S biased. Uh, so caffeine at the start, caffeine at two hours, any in between that? No, that'd probably be fine. And that's probably what I do. let's get super granular milligrams. Like are you doing a 250? No, no. 100 to 150. Okay. Yeah. Cap. I'm super sensitive to caffeine. So I'm always sheep. I, there's a lot of races. I don't even use it, especially if it's later for the sleep thing, but I know some people are just going crazy with it. It seems these days they're like, Oh, I got this two fifty gel. I'm like, how many did you take? Three? I was like, that, oh. that's so much caffeine. I got yeah. you're yeah. gonna be on a bender. Yeah. yeah. They're like, Well, it's seven o'clock. I think I'm good. I'm like, Whoo. But some people they can drink a coffee and go to bed. That's just not me. So no. What other, uh, any other low hanging fruit that not, maybe not even with the Evolo squad that you just think athletes that you've thought of, you're like, man, how are people missing this? Those were good ones. Um, Yeah, that's kind of, those are kind of my, my big, uh, my big three ones. Um, What do you think about, so since racing starting and if we could, obviously this really depends, I think a lot on how fit someone is at this point in the year, similar to what you said before, how far they are within their like quote unquote race career. But there's a lot of things going on in the Southeast right now. I was looking at this athlete's calendar and he's got, you know, three races. Like it's a Saturday, a Saturday, a Sunday race. He's got a week off. And then it's like an omnium. There's a lot of races coming. What were you, how would you approach that? Um, you know, the race is obviously high intensity. Would you do another workout maybe on Tuesday, maybe something on Wednesday, kind of too varied per person to even like jump in on that? Or what do you think? Yeah, about I that? think generally the mistake you would make is you would do the race, an easy day, intensity day, Wednesday, easy, easy. I think what happens is you start to lose the base. So it would be better to do like, you know, three to four hours in the middle. Yes. just to keep that base up because it's kind of like it kind of like the you know being fed comes first it's like doing some doing some zone two comes first like that's this is your baseline you have to mm-hmm. do this before you can continue with anything else um, i love to hear that because also i think there's um you had mentioned like a four by 20 tempo <clears throat> excuse me i don't have someone do that much because my people i'm thinking of are just not at your level uh that would wax them pretty well yeah but it's not um, it's not recommended yeah for civilians (laughs) for civilians 
but I would say I had somebody, you know, he does three hour rides during the week a lot of times. And I was like, yo, this Wednesday, can you jam in this three hour? Do you like a three by 10, three by 15? Cause Saturday's race is kind of like a B level race. Doesn't care about it too much. And similar thing. Cause otherwise the hours tank and we look over the next six weeks, like, dude, you haven't really ridden that much. And yeah. unless you're a crit boy, that's only looking for big one hour events uh as like your big races i should say yeah it's i think that is a trap that people fall into it's too much tapering it's never enough endurance um one guy had commented to me he's like dude i'm racing five hours on saturday should i really do a three hour ride on sunday I'm like i mean yeah if you can and it's yeah. not i mean okay. you got a whole other seven days before you're racing again um it's not just race and rest so What's, uh, what else you got kicking around? Um, what, let's, let's chat about NCL. How yeah. has your, is your training changing at all? Or is, how do you, I mean, you're good at crits anyway. So this is me. You're maybe the bad person to ask. Um, and maybe if you're thinking of gravel, maybe that's similar to like the Euro road race is just long and hard, but are you switching anything up for kind of the shifting calendar or just staying with the Stephen Bassett specials? Uh, very, very little. Cause I'm kind of like, okay, if, if I want to be the fittest bike racer possible, mm -hmm. and we know a lot of volume makes me fit mm -hmm. just because the races are shorter. It's like, it's not like you like multiply your race time by X to get how much volume you should ride. Um, so I'm doing pretty similar volume. Um, what I'm are you doing, doing these days? You know, 20, 22 cool. as a baseline kind of, I'm definitely doing, uh, yeah. Like I talked about like more, more zone three. Mm. So more time at intensity and like stretching that out a bit. Um, and then just kind of feathering in a bit of VO2 and, um, yeah, nothing that crazy. Nothing You're still, wild. Still a 30, 30, 40, 20 guy from last not time as, we talked? Not, not as, as much. much. I think I'm doing them more organically, just like with terrain and stuff, but not not as much. Sometimes into the uh occasionally into the the tempos, but yeah. I think I'm leaning more on the model of we're raising the general ceiling and then you know, yeah, it's just like we talked about. It's like yeah, if, if your race has like a hill at 20%, like you could go and ride like 60 RPM up this hill at 20%, or you could just do normal training and like get fitter and then the hill will be easier. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> you're yeah. generally just trying to be fitter and then all obstacles come back to you, you know? I, I like that. How do you feel about race specific training? Because that's just a slippery slope. And the reason that I always... I don't want to push back sounds too uh, not angsty, but that I'm yeah, disagreeing yeah, yeah. with somebody, but they'll be like, oh, well, there's this 10 minute climb. And I said, well, what happens if people attack like five minutes out? I'm like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, people might not wait for the climb. That's uh, actually your teammate. I use him as an example and he was coming off an injury. So of uh, Ryan Roth, when he you yeah. were on oh, silver yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. came to upstate New York. I don't know where he, what he was doing. I think somebody said he had a girlfriend somewhere. I'm yeah. like, yo dude, someone from silver's here. And it was our, it's uh maybe, maybe a 12 minute climb. And I'm like, oh, this guy's going to win. And so I'm like, no, I think he's injured. So anyways, I was not waiting to let this dude just blast us all on the climb. So two turns before the climb, there's this little rise. And I took off with three dudes and people looked at Ryan to like, you know, he's the guy in the silver kit, like chase these guys back. And they didn't. And it was like the, it, it's an example I like to give people because don't wait for the thing that everyone's waiting for surprise them. And so it wasn't yeah. this 12 minute effort. So the reason I say all this is if you're going to a race, you're like, Oh, well, there's this one feature. It might not be the feature. So how do you, you like, this race specific training can be very misleading. And so I love what you just said about, you know, just raise all of the fitness, be kind of ready for anything because who knows that race could have come down to a sprint or it could be, you know, so do you always, have you always looked at training that way is just general, just be the best Steve in all the different ways possible. And the race will just come to you. Um, I think it's changed with age a bit. Um, so yeah, kind of one thing I like, 
I don't know. This is not a specific number, but I kind of say like, you got to do something eight times to get better at it. Um, hmm. Going on. So that. it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, you want to do, you want to do some motor pacing and the motor pacing is going to give you the leg speed and it's going to give you the race rhythm, but it, you're going to do one motor pacing session a month, you know, twice. And it's like, well, would you be better served doing more climbs, you know, two times, three times a week? Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, if you want, if this, this race ends on a 10 minute hill and it's like, yeah, you could blow your load doing, you know, 10 minute efforts over and over. Um, and I used to do that for Joe Martin, like when I was like much younger in 1920, it was just, I would just, I kind of like would go at 500 until I blew up. Uh, and then eventually I could just do it. But, you know, it was many years later that I could just do it, oh, where I would have probably been better served doing something else, <laughs> not quite as hard, that would have stimulated the growth, that would have pushed me to where I could do that 500 for 10 minutes, instead of just, you know, trying yeah. to, trying to willpower my way uh, to that, you know, arbitrary number. Yeah, that's, oh, man. So that's interesting um, to kind of play off of that. Uh, I'm trying to think of where, what sparked this. Um, but I was doing some VO2. I'm a very classic, like five by five guy. I kind of, in maybe the past two years, got into doing some, they're like a really hard start and then more like 110%, but doing like not eight, nine minute ones. And then I was looking and I don't know what really sparked this, but I was like, Hey, I'm going to do a TTE just, okay, here's the number. And I'm just going to ride until I blow up. And then the next one, say I get to like seven minutes, I'm going to pin the number again. And maybe I only get to five minutes. And it's actually been a kind of effective workout in a very, it's, it's not, I'm not just like staring at the Watts knowing I got to go five minutes. It's like, Oh man, no, no, I can go another 30 seconds. Like this kid, I just got to go another 30 seconds. Another, th And so it's sort of, it's interesting to hear you say, like, you just did this thing to you blew up and you would do something different. It's so, there's just so many ways to do intervals that I think maybe that's what I'm stumbling. I'm like, Oh, this kind of seems fresh after training in different ways for so long. Um, 30 thirties yeah. never resonated with me. So for VO2 max, I'm like never doing that. I just hate them, which is, I probably should do them more then. but, um, so a lot of tempo. What are you doing threshold wise? Do you do steady state? Do you ever ride at threshold? Do you do over unders? Um, a lot of times I would do something like you know the last two minutes of a tempo effort, you jump up to to VO two or just over. Um, but pretty much, <laughs> I pretty much never do efforts by time. I do them by hill. <laughs> um, ah, okay. Which. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that's so, good or bad. Yeah, I mean, no. Yeah. we're here to hear yeah i mean there's no right or wrong what's so do you never ride like at threshold uh very rarely okay. very rarely would i do like a 20 minutes full yeah like you know very it's... very limited because i feel like those efforts i can go super super deep but it it kind of puts me in a hole it's it's kind of like i want to save them for uh for something where i could put my arms up at the end mm, fair yeah, I have my latest running theory because I kind of came up in the old school. Like three by 20 was like the, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. And then maybe again in the past two to three years was doing more over-unders. But then I started to lose this like diesel power that I used to have. And now my theory for myself is that like, like everything in this, 95 to 105 range like gets me up to a point where i'm at but it doesn't really like grow anything and then adding the over-unders and the vo2 max kind of is that like sprinkles and cherry on top that really like gets me into race form and i could be full of bs but i've been working with one of our other coaches landry and it's kind of like a style that he flows with and it's been working well so now i'm like huh this is i'm curious about this um i i guess the biggest thing that I learned was like too much of anything usually never ends well for me. Um, it's just like the repetitive nature. I need some variety at some point. Yeah, yeah. So um, what else you got going on? Not a whole lot, man. Just uh, 
When do you start That's, racing? When does the racing start? Sorry to cut you so off. April 10th. Okay. Uh, Redlands. Yeah. So will you so will the whole Denver squad go out that go to that? Or is this okay? So yeah, you guys cool. do things Coleman's besides NCL crits. Or that yeah. is NCL. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a common uh a common confusion. So we yeah. do pretty much we'll do Redlands, we'll do Joe Martin, we'll do uh you know the Air Force, the Tulsa okay. Nationals. Okay. So I mean yeah. we pretty much do everything that you could do. Yeah. That okay, I'm glad you said I didn't realize that. Yeah. So yeah. now I was even looking on, I was trying to get a little bit more familiar on the website. I know Denver's, it's like schedule coming soon. I'm like, let's go guys. This like, where are these guys going to be at? So, all right. I'm just thinking through, have you ever done Valley of the Sun and Tucson bike classic? Yes. I've done very poorly at both. Yeah. Really? Why do you yeah. think? Um, I think it was actually, I think it was both of them. I was like coming off of a training camp, which for mm-hmm. me, racing off of a training camp is not that good mm-hmm. um i don't yeah, yeah i never have like i never feel i always feel a bit flat after a training camp i kind of uh, want to go out there at some point and i haven't really done much out west and i'm like yeah it's funny when you're slightly injured i'm like planning big crusades already for 2025 and someone like dude it's february we're still in yeah, you still inside on time, zwift it, you've got time I'm like nice ah, you know, I think also social media, I get FOMO easy. I'm like, oh yeah, my God, yeah, these people yeah, are racing on here. And then you talk to these athletes and they're all like having a good time. I'm like, ah, oh, I'll be there. So you're coaching. How do people get in touch with you if they want to talk about coaching? It is uh, bassettcoaching at gmail.com. Super Sweet. easy. And yeah. uh, Instagram, they can slide them in the DMs. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, any other topics we need to hit on? I don't want to take up too much of your time too. I always appreciate chatting with you and chopping it up and seeing what you're doing. I'm a huge Stephen Bassett fan. So I'm excited to hear that you guys are doing more than just NCL crits. I didn't realize that. So this yeah. is, that makes then I guess more sense of why some of the riders that are on the team, including you are there. Um, yeah. You guys will have opportunity to go knock heads. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, I think one of my biggest, I think my biggest thing in coaching actually is just trying to give people like a sense of self-efficacy. So like you should feel empowered, like you should feel like you know what you're doing and like mm. uh you know like your competence and then your confidence those are kind of tied hand in hand so like i mean i feel like every pro i've ever met if you told them hey man all you have to do to like win a big race is you're gonna have to ride 30 hours a week on the trainer you can't ride outside but you have to ride 30 hours a week on the trainer for six weeks every single one of them would do it you know there's no lack of desire there's no lack of like commitment um like you'll meet a cat four off the street and they train so hard like so i think the biggest thing is like giving somebody a sense of this is a generally correct model to follow and if we like correct within that then that's then that's a pathway where a lot of things are achievable Mm, i love that i think also the the cat four example i think sometimes people almost feel badly that they take it so seriously which is why I love to laugh. I'm like, oh, I'm like, well, then you make me feel terrible because I take this way too seriously. Oh, I'm like, yeah, why yeah. do you, you know, like you should take it seriously. You invest a lot of time into this. Even if, you know, someone's like, oh, I only ride 12 hours. I'm like, go talk to someone at your job and ask them if they exercise for 12 hours a week. Like, dude, this is, you should take this seriously. I mean, you want to go to these races and like, you love this sport. Like, and so I think you're talking about like having them understand why they're doing what they're doing also just this journey should be fun and it's uh, you know it's not another job it's uh yeah, yeah, and then yeah. the hard work that you put in there's so much to reap from that even if you don't win the race like you know maybe you're on a team and you just get to go like slay it with your friends for the weekend yeah um yeah i know you said <laughs> you said not to curse from here but <laughs> like uh, i always tell people like yeah bike racing is just an excuse to like talk shit with people in a parking lot you know what i mean like <laughs> It's like, it's both. It's both. It's like, you know, you should be taking it serious and you should also be, there is also a lot of community and, um, you know, that is the number one tip that I try to pass. I shouldn't say number one tip, but I do. Cause I was very, uh, I, shy is not the right word. I was very trying to find an identity 
outside of my normal life in bike racing that I was like there for results, there to win with my team, there to like prove something to myself, but also get external validation. And I did not connect like in my own town, I was super close to all the riders. But say I went out to like Massachusetts or something, I was like, show up. I was like, Ugh, like, I don't know anybody here. Go race, get in the car and go home. Like the totally wrong way to do it. And it wasn't until I started, you know, one of my friends, I'm actually, I might do Green Mountain this year because I'm going to his wedding. We raced against each other in 2012. It wasn't until we were tour cat skills. And I'm like, hey man, I see you all the time. What's your name? And he's like, oh, what's up? I'm Andrew. Da, 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 da. And we were like chopping it up. And we actually became teammates three years later. But I should have been doing that every race leading yeah, up yeah, to that. Yeah. And that was really like a eye-opening experience. Of, I, but, you know, I think it's intimidation. I think it's, uh, you know, when you start going to bigger races, I was super intimidated by everybody that I didn't know. I was like, and I didn't realize a lot of other people were feeling the same way. It did. Oh, yeah, for sure. It just be like, hey, we're at this bike race together in a place 400 miles from both of our houses yeah, and find commonality in that. So, all right, man. Well, good yeah. luck this year. I appreciate yeah, you chatting. This is good. Some good tips for people. And uh, so a April 10th, you said? Mm -hmm. That's the first race. Awesome. Kicks off. Let's get it. Hopefully we cross paths in the, uh, I know you're a Parkway guy, but <laughs> <laughs> get like me to the Tennessee, North Carolina border. Uh, you know, Johnny Mitchell? Yeah, 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 yeah. Somewhere over in that area. He was riding with Milligan guys. I said, I texted him. I said, can I come be the Steven Bassett to the Evolo crew with the Milligan with the Milligan team? He's like, you're welcome anytime. I was like, awesome. So yeah, people yeah. know you're out there. Good luck with the Evolo guys. They're very fortunate to have somebody like oh, you. Oh, yeah. They're, oh, man. They're, they're so dialed in. Awesome. Very, be looking forward to that. They're very them. supported. Hell yeah. All right, man. We'll talk soon.